Cool. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mike Cass. I am the executive director and founder of Blind Institute of Technology. Uh, we are a uh, local uh, nonprofit 501c3. Uh, our mission is to help the BVI, the blind visually impaired community, find gainful employment opportunities. We do that through a series of programs, uh, which includes uh, for our candidate or our blind visually impaired side of the house, we help them with uh, resume prep, resume uh, uh, engagement. We make sure that your resume gets in front of uh, amazing organizations, which are represented here on the uh, panel today, making sure, because it, it's a visual thing. So how do you overcome that very real visual obstacle? So we make sure that we help you with that obstacle. We help you with uh, interview prep. How do you feel like you are on your game, ready for that very intimidating interview? We want to make sure that you are ready to go. Uh, we help organizations, small companies like DaVita, Aetna, Comcast, Denver Health, Google, Microsoft, uh, all over the country understand the real advantages and the real assets that we, the blind visually impaired community, are when we are part of their team. Uh, truly, to hire a blind person is not a human resources solution. It is a technology solution. So to me, regardless of where your site is, there's always going to be a component of accessible or assistive technology. And we are there to help organizations understand just how easy it is to implement that accessible technology. So I uh, personally, my name, i uh, from um, Ohio originally, moved out here in 1985. I uh, love uh, Denver, Colorado. I am a... Uh, uh, gosh, I've been married 21 years now. I've got three kids. I've got a 20, 20, oh, it's going to tell me how old I am, 25, 24, and seven-year-old. Yeah, oops, it does happen, yeah. So, uh, some things you can't take back, guys, so, uh, so that is what it is. So, I, um, yeah, I, uh, let's see here, been married 21 years. Uh, uh, let's see here, three kids. Professionally, I was an IT nerd uh, from the mid-90s all the way through uh, uh, just a few years ago when I started BIT, and I left because I was always the token blind guy. Um, I worked for some big companies, and I was it. And so I started doing some due diligence, started doing some digging, and I uh, just found out the uh, unemployment epidemic, and that's what it really is. It's an unemployment epidemic within our community. Um, there's nobody really doing anything about it out there. So I left a six-figure income, single-family income, uh, to make a difference, and that is the Blind Institute of Technology. Uh, we've done a pretty good job. We're, we're being uh, pretty uh, successful against our mission. Uh, in the last three years, we've gotten 33 placements um, in 36 months. Uh, we've raised uh, a little over half a million dollars. Um, we are. We just were in CBS for Jim Beneman did an interview with us. We got uh, front page of the Denver Post. We've been in the Denver Business Journal a couple times, Network World. Uh, we're getting the message out there about really being what I call us is the greatest untapped resource in America. So uh, my blind, visually impaired community members, I do this for you. And uh, But this is not the show uh, for me. I want to introduce to you uh, three amazing professionals. Uh, this is exactly why I do what I do, because I get to meet some of the most amazing people uh, to me in the country and the world. I have blind, visually impaired people all over the globe reach out to me, and I just have been blessed to have three of the most uh, interesting and fascinating people um, here in the Denver metro area. Uh, and so uh, we're going to let them introduce themselves uh, personally, um, right uh, to, from your right to your left. So Eric, take it away. Thank you, Mike. Uh, my name is Eric Arthur. I'm from Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, when I was 17, I was diagnosed with Stargardt's, and so I have what's called low vision. Um, so I have no central vision. But despite that, I was able to get my undergraduate degree at the State University of New York at New Paltz in anthropology. And then about a couple years ago, I got my MBA at CSU. And so um, I work at DaVita now as a business analyst in their IT department. And I primarily use Zoom text um, to use a computer. And so I zoom in on everything. And I also use the reader function when I uh, have to read more than a couple lines. Um, but we'll probably talk more about my professional career here in a little while. Um, so I'll pass it. OK, Christine. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Eric, Christine, take it away. Hi, my name is Christine McGordy. Um, I have lived in Colorado, amazingly, at this point for 17 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long. I grew up in Massachusetts. I was uh, mainstream through the public schools. I have Lieber's congenital amaurosis, 
And uh, I learned a new term this morning that I have contrast vision. I had never heard a description for what my vision is. But um, so as a child, I could see a little bit more than I can now, but I'm, I'm functionally pretty close to being a total. Um, I went to college at a small private liberal arts college in Massachusetts called Hampshire College. And then I got my master's degree in public administration from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I'll turn it over to Mike. Awesome, Mr. Kemp, thank you, Christine. Um, so my name is Mike Kemp. I am a Colorado native, one of the, the few. Um, and I went to college at the University of Denver, um, got my master's there as well. Um, I am married to a lovely lady that I met uh, while I was there, and we have a two-year-old son. So that takes up a big chunk of my time, and it's all pretty great. Awesome. And, and Mike, can you tell me, uh, what, what, is your, what is your eyesight, please? Yeah. Um, so I have achromatopsia, um, so no cones uh, in my retinas, um, which puts my vision at about 2200. So. Okay. And we'll start with you then. So then uh, tell us, you know, professionally, what is it that you do, and how do you do what you do with uh, your, your vision impairment? Sure, so uh, professionally I've, I've bounced around a, li a little bit. Um, so I, when I graduated with my MBA, I started working at uh, Newmont Mining Corporation. Um, so as you can imagine, that was a, a fairly unique situation where they're sending a blind guy to the middle of nowhere in Peru. Um, <laughs> and uh, there, there's a few adaptations that that you have to do, especially in a situation like that. So I, I couldn't read the signs um, to be able to tell me which flight was my flight. Um, and so what I would do is there's typically two flights in Peru, one going to Machu Picchu and then one going to this small regional airport where our, our mine site was. And the, um, the, uh, the way I would tell the difference is mine was the line in which no one was speaking English. Um, <laughs> And, and so, you know, there were no white people in my, in my line. So I, I knew I was in the right place in situations like that. So there's a lot of adaptations that I learned um, there. And I was doing finance for those people and doing a lot of board presentations, which a lot of you know involves a lot of colored charts. Um, and having no color vision, um, what we'd have to do is I would go into all of my charts and make sure that there's some coding in the back of it, the RGB coding. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. And um, you can make sure that it's all consistently a, the same color. And one of the board members actually made a comment. He goes, wow, my charts are always like spot on color wise. How do you think he does that? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's the colorblind guy who's not missing the, the colors. <laughs> Way to use data, buddy. Um, so you know, th those are a couple of, of things. And I've since, um, I'm a, now a reformed finance guy. I'm in project management now. Um, with a, a company called Brio Solutions. Um, and so I'm doing project management for companies like Denver Public Schools, Red Robin, um, a few other organizations across Colorado. So, Awesome. Thank you. Christine, can you uh, tell us what you do professionally, please? I work for the state of Colorado in the Department of Public Health and Environment's budget office. I'm a budget manager. And before that, I worked for the I worked for the city and county of Denver in their budget office. Um, I worked for Denver for about eight years, and Mike told me I had to brag a little bit. So while I was at Denver, I started as an associate analyst, and I promoted to being a senior, and then I was promoted to being a supervisor, which is kind of the career path in that office. And I, as a blind person, was able to negotiate that career path successfully. I left there, and I've been at the state of Colorado for about eight years, and what I do is help prepare the budget submissions to go to the legislature, and I help um, review all bills that come through our department that have a fiscal impact. So I do a lot of words, and I do a lot of numbers, uh, a lot of Word and a lot of Excel. Um, oh, and Mike said I have to tell you that I, I this year was nominated for and won Administrative Employee of the Year. Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
Awesome. Thank you, Christine. Eric, I know you touched on a little bit, although tell us a little bit more what you do at Davida, please. Sure. I'm a business analyst in our IT department, so I provide analytical support to our senior managers. Um, so I help produce charts, much like, much in the same manner that Mike um, produced his charts. And uh, most of those are for capacity planning and internal operations. And so I produce wonderful metrics and then try and help other people understand them. Um, and But when I first started at DaVita, I was hired as what they called as a change agent. Um, and that was through the BIT. They helped me get the interview. They set that whole process up for me. Um, and I would help develop the communications and structure the deployment of our software internally. And in December, they promoted me to the business analyst position. Um, so that's been really cool. And before that, uh, I was getting my MBA at CSU, and I'd kind of become disgruntled with trying to find a job uh, right after I graduated. Uh, There's about a six or seven month period where I was unemployed. And so um, I decided to start a cremator repair business with my dad. Uh, He's kind of a refractory engineer and can build, you know, power plants, cement plants, large industrial kilns like that. And so he knew how to repair uh, cremators. And I was having so much trouble in the job world, the job search, before I linked up with Mike Hess um, that I decided I would just, you know, try my hand at being an entrepreneur. And it was fun. It was a great learning experience. But crawling in a cremator gets old pretty quickly. So <laughs> we decided... <laughs> I decided did, I was going to do cremator, something. Right? I did. Pet okay. mortuary. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> They're warm in the winter. Uh, but. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, and Eric, we'll stick with you. So let's get to the, um, let's start. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'll, I'll keep my chin up like that. I'll look all dignified or something. Um, I think you might go off. No. Can you guys hear me? I just gotta, yeah. all right. So um, so literally, uh, so uh, let's start getting to the heart of the matter here because we all know that the uh, there's a uh, large number of blind, visually impaired people that are either um, unemployed or, or underemployed. I wish I could tell you how many uh, master's degrees, double master, bachelor, double bachelor degree candidates. I even know attorneys um, who have passed the bar exam and are making $10 an hour uh, being marginalized because, uh, quite honestly, when we walk into an interview uh, with a cane or a guide dog, or if we do what we call fake it, where we have no central vision, but we attempt to fake, you know, like uh, we can see just like everybody else, um, the little, the most slightest anomaly within that interview process uh, completely weeds you out of the process, right? And so the whole point of disclosure, full disclosure, how do you do that? Uh, I personally am all about, uh, so I, I, again, I believe we're the greatest untapped resource in America because we overcome challenges every single day. We sharpen that innovative sharpening, that tool set on a daily basis because we have to. And so to me, I am loud and proud about uh, being visually impaired and being able to overcome challenges within the corporate environment, within my everyday environment. So, so that is my approach. I'm not saying that everybody else has to adopt that. Although, so with that said, when we walk into an interview, there, there's, a, there's a shift, right? So people meet you for the first time. They see the cane, the guide dog. Something's amiss. How do we overcome that? So... Um, Eric, what I would love for you to talk about is, because uh, you already touched on that, like your, your, your employment. How, so let's talk about obtaining and maintaining employment uh, as a blind, visually impaired person. Uh, you know, what, what separates you? What have you learned to overcome and to be successful in both obtaining and then maintaining employment? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I mean, when I first started looking for employment after I had my, I had gotten my MBA, I was kind of shooting myself in the foot because I, I was somebody who would try and fake it in the interview. And I was even told by a counselor at one point, oh, your disability is so great because you can hide it. And it's not like something you have to be open about. And so inevitably, you know, they would figure out that, you know, I couldn't see. And um, it, 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 was, uh, it was a difficult situation to manage. And, you know, I was becoming frustrated because I didn't know how I was supposed to, um, you know, let these people know that I was blind and visually impaired, but yet I was still a very valuable employee and I didn't want to scare them off or put them off by saying that. Um, and once I talked to Mike, he kind of taught me that, you know, through the BIT, you just ha you'd have to own it. And when you own it and you're proud of it and you're totally um, open about your, your visual impairment, it was easy to kind of break that barrier. And once I'd said that, it was like, oh, okay, you know, they realized it and then we moved on. 
And that's really where I started to gain traction with the interviews, um, especially at DaVita. And so I think that was the big shift for me in obtaining employment is rather than trying to hide it, I owned it and was proud of it. Um, and that carried over into continuing to um, have my employment is it's really I, I walk in with this very positive attitude that yes, you know, I'm happy to be here despite the fact that I'm blind or visually impaired. Um, I'm still a very valuable part of the team and when um, something goes wrong and I'm, I still maintain that positive attitude like there's a fire drill at work or a project doesn't go the way it should and everybody else is, you know, stressed out and they're going through the fire drill with me and I'm still that same positive person. They're like, you know, they look at me and they're like, oh, it's not that bad. Eric's dealing with this just fine despite the fact that he's visually impaired and um, I'm not and I'm stressed out. How can I be stressed out? And so I kind of just raised the general um, tone for all the teams that I'm on by maintaining that same attitude, which is a saying that I got from the BIT, which is aptitude and attitude. Um, and I think that that's a really important part is, you know, you, it's clear that m many people in the blind and visually impaired community have tremendous aptitude based on the number of people that have, you know, master's degrees and these higher education degrees. And the, the other piece is the attitude where you just show up and you own it and you're proud of it and, you know, um, you bring, the, bring it to the table as a value add rather than as a disability. Thank you, Eric. And, and, and so, Christine, um, so on, on the on the panel with the three, so uh, we we bookended, we put the beauty in the middle, guys. So just to let you know, uh, that was very strategic. So um, uh, so for those of you who do have sight, so uh, Christine, now you, uh, for all intents and purposes, you are uh, screen reader, accessible technology exclusive user, correct? Correct. Okay. So tell us, uh, you're obtaining and maintaining not only just surviving in a uh, in, in a competitive environment, but thriving. Uh, please. So I want to give a shout out to DVR, and I know some people um, don't always have the best experience with DVR, but they were instrumental in my getting my first job with the city of Denver. I had finished graduate school and I, I lived in Tucson, Arizona for a year and I was completely unsuccessful in finding a job in Tucson. It, it, it's a tough job market, but I, I really struggled. So a variety of reasons, I ended up here in Denver and I applied for this job at the city of Denver and at the same time I was taking DVR's course. I, I think Mike is now providing a lot of the kinds of things that DVR provided to me. One of the things I learned in that course was to do informational interviews. And I did an informational interview for this at the city when I had applied for this job and they hired somebody else. And then that somebody else left after two days and they called me and they offered me the job. So because I had put myself out there and because I had um, been on their radar screen when their opportunity showed up, I, I got that job. I also think that, um, again, Mike's doing the work to build bridges to employers and that is so important because it's, uh, Eric was talking about our attitude, but it's also the attitude of the people that are hiring us. So the woman that hired me in the city and county of Denver you had to do some kind of physical to get hired with the city government has all kinds of crazy bureaucracy. And when my paperwork got to the, the doctor who was supposed to sign off on it, he said no. He said, we are not hiring somebody who's blind. And that woman went to bat for me. She fought to get me hired. And um, I would never have gotten there if she hadn't stuck up for me. Similar experience, or it's the related experience, when I switched over to the state of Colorado, the man that interviewed me had a daughter with cerebral palsy. So he was not afraid of disabilities. He knew we could do things, and I, I think that was a big part of why that hiring experience wasn't a struggle for me, because this individual was familiar. So again, I think the work Mike's doing to get folks comfortable with disability, get folks familiar with disability is really, really critical. Um, I would say that probably the two most important things are 
technology skills and interpersonal skills. Uh, Eric's right, if you keep a positive attitude, it makes everything go better for everybody. I uh, do a lot of work with Word and Excel and computers, and um, as you all know, technology is changing fast. And I actually re retooled a couple years ago. I went back to DVR because I had fallen a little bit behind. Uh, the state was moving over to Google for some of its applications, and I kind of had been in a little bit of a rut and hadn't been keeping up with the technology. So I went back to DVR and got an iPhone and got training on an iPhone. And I will tell you that I didn't know this at the time, but being able to text in this work environment is critical. I, I unfortunately, <laughs> get texts from the deputy director of the department at six o'clock at night. And that is the expectation out there today that you are plugged in and that you are on top. And I, I would be struggling to keep up were I not sort of staying with the tools and, and keeping up. And again, that's, that's why Mike's guys are so important because there aren't a lot of people out there that know how to use Google Docs with a screen reader. And it, it's, it's tough going to figure some of that out. So the more folks can stay current with technology, I, I think that's an important, important tool. And I also think uh, to, to points that have already been made, being able to be positive about your disability, people are freaked out, um, and if you can't put them at ease, they're, they're not gonna hire you. I applied for a job a couple of years ago and my old boss, who was my reference, called me after the reference check and said, that guy was asking very inappropriate questions about how you could do things and how you were gonna do things. And um, I did not end up getting that job and I don't know how much blindness was a factor in that, but uh, it was interesting for me to have that information from that reference check that he was asking those questions because people are curious and if you don't explain to them where you're coming from, they're gonna, they're gonna react out of that anxiety and discomfort and they're not gonna offer you the job. You're so PC, let's just call a big red truck a big red truck, okay? So, um, uh, so thank you, Christine. So Mike, out of the three, uh, so you, so because you started off in the, in the jungles of Peru and made your way to, you know, being a project manager, you did a stint at DaVita as well. And so for you, obtaining and maintaining employment um, you know, almost, let's call it, gosh, I hate using that word normal, almost like a normal employee, a normal, like able-bodied employee where you're able to go to, I mean, three major organizations that I know of and, uh, you know, so obtaining and maintaining with your visual impairment, please tell us. Sure. I think the, the most important thing for me is to make it not an obstacle in my own mind. Um, so I think, you know, there are times, and I'm sure a lot of you identify with this, where you go, God, what am I doing here? What, can I really compete in this sighted world? Um, and, and really shutting that voice out and saying, yes, I can. Um, because if, if I don't believe that I can do it, why would an employer believe that I can do it? Um, and so, so that, for me, was step one. Um, and then step two was some of the best professional advice I ever got was make them chase you. So to me, what that means is in every, you know, say they, they do hire a blind guy as a, as a charity case. Well, the first assignment that they give me, I am going to nail. And by nail, I mean not just do what they ask me to do, but also think about, okay, well, what else are they going to want after this is done? You know, I'm thinking you're probably going to want another report on this next market segment. Why don't I just start on that? So that way in the meeting, I'm saying, okay, here was the research you asked for, and by the way, here's this other work that I think is going to be valuable to you. Um, and, and, you know, even if it was the, the, just the dumbest assignment I'd ever received and wasn't going to provide value, once they saw that that was the level of work that I was going to provide, um, that's when the perception started to change. Um, and, and then from that point on, how I've been able to maintain employment is by establishing that reputation of consistently just delivering good work so that when I, so I did a really, really stupid thing and um, with a one-year-old at home, um, I quit my job in finance because I absolutely hated it and 
you know, wasn't, wasn't liking it very much and, uh, and decided to pursue project management. And so there were about four months where I was, you know, kind of looking for a job. And I think what, what ended up happening is someone that I had worked with at Newmont who knew that I had this reputation wanted to hire me. So, so your network is what gets you hired more so than your interview or your, your resume. And so really having that reputation that's fairly clean across all the organizations that I worked at really helped me land where I am today. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. So let's, let's stick with you on this and uh, um, what, help us understand um, how you approach, uh, again, blind, visually impaired. We've already talked about owning it, keeping a positive attitude. You know, what, what is it that can help us go into an interview situation, though, and how, how have you approached that? You know, uh, full disclosure, explaining to them, like, help us understand, like, you know, how you prepare yourself. So if anybody's in the audience can get an idea of, like, okay, you know, how you, how you dress, how you prepare, how you, like, you want to go into that interview where they want to chase you, where they want you on the spot, regardless of the BVI situation. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of, of research that you can do on that. Um, but I think in general, I am always dressing probably one caliber above where I think is necessary um, because, you know, with the, the visual impairment, all right, I've got, say that's a mark against me in someone's book. Well, all right, but he was really impeccably dressed and he, you know, he came, he came prepared. He takes this seriously, even more seriously than I do. Um, you know, is, is what you want the employer thinking. So that's one of the reasons I always try to dress as, as well as I can. Um, and then really in talking about it with the employer, um, sometimes it's the first thing that you'll mention. So um, my favorite is when they, they give you that, that question and they'll say, tell me about a time when you overcome the obstacle, you, when you overcame an obstacle. I'm like, All right, you just stepped into my wheelhouse. Um, <laughs> And, and so that's um, typically my favorite question, but usually I'll start off with, yes, I'm blind, and let me tell you why that makes me a better employee. Um, so one, I'm able to solve problems um, that, that other people may not encounter. So, you know, a lot of us, okay, well, what happens when there's a, you know, construction on your street? For a sighted person, okay, well, you take the detour. For a blind person, it's a little more complicated. Um, and so we're able to deal with problems that I think sighted people wouldn't really think about. And so problem solving is a part of what we do. Um, also our ability to listen very clearly. I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to a presentation with an executive and it was a really flashy presentation. They did all the cool graphics, everything looked great, but the content was just probably some of the dumbest ideas I've ever heard. And they were gonna green light the project. Well, the presentation was excellent, um, you know, says the executive to me and it's like, okay, well think about the idea. You know, let's, let's step out of the visual, um, which is, I think is difficult for a lot of sighted people to do, um, but that's a skill that we can provide. Um, frequently, and you know, no offense to the doctors in the room, but scientists tend to flash a lot of numbers on the screen in an attempt to confuse you about what's actually happening. Um, and so what I can provide value of, okay, I can't even see those numbers, but theoretically your idea does or does not make sense, um, and I can kind of sense check in that way. Um, so those are some of the, the good talking points that I think are helpful when you go into an interview to be able to say, yes, this is the value that you're going to get out of hiring a blind person. So it's not just that you're you know, doing this out of the goodness of your heart. There are skills that I have that others do not. Love it. Thank you. And Christine, same thing with you. So again, being, being essentially a total, I mean, you get a little light contrast, right? Although you're a screen reader, screen reader user exclusively. So it's what, you know, going into an interview or going into, so I mean, you, you, you talk with, I don't know, you know, slightly influential people like legislators, uh, Senator Newell and all sorts of other folks on a regular basis. How is it that you go in there, uh, disarm them, impress them, engage them? How is it that you go and be a rock star with the situation you're in? I want to go back to what Mike said, and it's all about your confidence. And I, I'm going to tell you a, a, a not happy story about another interview I went on once at BU, as a matter of fact. Yeah, 
sorry. Um, so I went in and it was going really well and I did the second interview and they had this large group interview and then I brought my little flash drive with my little copy of Window Eyes to see if I could access their, um, I think it was a, some kind of legacy computer system at that point in time. And uh, I put my little flash drive in and they turned the legacy system on and guess what happened? No access. No access. <laughs> So that was a really tough lesson for me to learn. Um, I agree that it's really important to be upfront and, and uh, this notion of talking about the positives of blindness was not sort of as, as on the radar screen when I was interviewing. So as I think more about this, it, it really is problem solving is such an important skill and we do it every day. And when I tell this, my problem solving story, it's funny, it's the same story. It's construction site, bus doesn't stop in the right place, you get off the bus, you think you're where you're not. And how do you figure out how to get where you're going when you just got off the bus and now you don't know where you are? Um, so problem solving is such a critical skill. I think to emphasize the positive is really, really important. Uh, I would recommend that you never do what I did and don't talk about logistics and specifics of how are you going to use this particular system until you have the offer in your hand. Um, I, I think legally they're not allowed to ask us about our disability. I think it's critical that we be proactive in the interview and talk about the positives and talk about why it's not going to be a barrier. But I think it's important if they want to go into the specifics of um, technical kinds of things that, that we gracefully and respectfully defer that to a time when uh, there's an offer been made. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. Uh, although I, I still want to, I mean, the, uh, the audience would love to hear how, again, she, she's very modest. She, she goes and she, she works with, you know, uh, senators and, and House representatives on a consistent basis, okay? Some pretty high profile, always, you know, they need it yesterday if they need it by a minute. And so how is it that you go out there and be, continue to be a rock star with this really high pressure? He's overblowing. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I happen to have worked with, put him in touch with Senator Newell, and so he thinks I'm really important. But no. um, as I said earlier, technology is, is so critical. And I remember back to graduate school in 1997, Excel wasn't very screen reader friendly at that point in time. And I did not do well, ironically, in my graduate class on public sector budgeting because Excel was not very accessible. Fortunately, between the time that I was in graduate school and the time that I started working, uh, Freedom Scientific had made a lot of progress on JAWS and it was quite accessible. So I, I technology is our friend and I could not have done the job that I do today. I could not have done that job in 1985 because it is very spreadsheet intensive. It is very word document intensive. Um, uh, legislation that I have to review comes in PDF. For the most part, I do pretty well with those PDFs, um, but you know, JAWS can be a little unstable with a PDF. So there's some frustration in up, oh, blew it up, got to reboot, try the PDF again. Um, and I think back to some points that other people have made. I, I, I think why I've done well is because I, I really am a good employee. I try hard. I work hard, I do my best, I jump out in front of projects as Mike was saying, I don't wait for people to come to me. And I think that that can do attitude and that do attitude is really, really important. And I'm thinking about Mike's specific question and I'm thinking about uh, networking is really important. And the people that I work with have complete confidence in me and so they're willing to send me down to the Capitol to uh, interface with legislators because I have proven to them that I am very capable and very hardworking and very confident. So 
You know, I, I think getting in the door can be pretty challenging. And then I think once we get in the door, a lot, a lot of it is within our control based on our attitude and, and our, our go getting. And I, I'll never forget that moment in that interview when I put that um, thumb drive in there and it didn't work. And talk about a loss of confidence. I mean, I totally deflated and I freaked out and so they freaked out. So how we carry ourselves is, is so very important in this whole process. Awesome, thank you. I appreciate that, Christine. So Mr. Arthur here has uh, recently, uh, the young man, I think he's still only like 15 years old and he's already been promoted a couple times. So um, just because I'm so old, Eric. Uh, the, uh, so he, again, how, how do you, blind visually impaired person in a very competitive, very regulated uh, organization like DaVita, all of a sudden, I mean, you've been there just over a year, you've already been promoted one or two times. Like, how is it that you go in there, blind, visually impaired person, and become a rock star? What is it that you're doing, buddy? Uh, well, I think I would echo what um, these two have said already, just because, uh, you know, I do take that same mentality that when I'm given a task, what I produce is above and beyond. And it's, I think it goes back to the fact that, um, my sighted counterparts, which I'm performing at the same level and better now, look at this as more of a nine to five. Like they've got this job and it's like, great, this is what they'll do and then they'll go back and live their lives. But for me, it's much more important than that. It's like I'm making a statement. I'm representing the blind and visually impaired community. I'm, I'm part of something that's bigger than just a nine to five. And so when I'm given a task, I really pour my, my heart and soul into it because it means so much more. And now I've developed that reputation where they know if they give me a task, it's gonna come out stellar. And I, may, I am sure that it does happen like that. Um, and so I think that's probably the main reason that I've been able to excel in the current position is I've just got, um, I'm more motivated maybe than the people that I'm competing against because I'm part of something bigger that maybe that they don't align with as much as I do. Um, Love it. So, uh, so what's fascinating to me, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, again, uh, three completely different skill sets up here, three uh, different approaches on how to do things, but you know, um, maintaining employment, guys, is really, it's, it's, it sounds to me like it's a whole lot of attitude, right? I mean, if, we, if we're doing the work, if we're doing the due, dil due diligence with our, with our education, we're staying current on the technology, once we get in the door, the world is ours, okay? So it's how we approach that. So uh, that's really what I got out of this. Uh, but what I'd love is if there's any questions in the audience that you guys have of the panelists, these three dynamic people up here, any questions? Do you have a mic runner? I, I should not be running the mic. I know, I was yeah. thinking that. Yeah. Is Claudia in yeah. here? So if you if you want to yell out a question, I'll repeat it so the yeah, people can fine. hear that. So yeah, they, uh, do not raise your hand on me. This is not a prop. Okay. <laughs> All right. So just yell yell out if you got a question. So the question, the question for uh, the recording, uh, gentlemen, your name, sir? Ted Robinson. Ted uh, asked uh, uh, Christine specifically uh, about an employment opportunity where the city and county of Denver, it, it, this sounds like a legal question and I'm not sure if you're gonna go there or not, Christine. <laughs> well, I'll say a couple things. I heard that through the grapevine after the, the boss had gone to bat for me, so Nobody said that to me directly. It was it was all hearsay. But I will say that at that time, the, the job descriptions were very antiquated and there was literally language in the job description that talked about being able to see, um, old fashioned job descriptions used to talk about all kinds of different things and they were very specific. So uh, if I'm inferring where you're going, had that gone down differently, I certainly would have had grounds to sort of uh, resist that action, but I, I think Eric said it, it. It's always better to be in a place where, you're, where your folks want you than where you've litigated your way in, um, but there are rules and there are laws around what they're allowed to 
do and what they're allowed to say. And un unfortunately, I think my experience is a lot of people don't, don't want to fight that when they do get discriminated against. Um, they're kind of discouraged and they, and they don't want to fight that. So that's another piece that I think maybe Mike can add to his list of things that he does is to sort of support people when they get turned down. But let me tell you, they're going to lose because you have to fight uh, discrimination. Yeah, well, and, and I to so it's it's interesting, Ted. I uh, um, uh, discrimination is a very real thing. Okay, and if anybody in here of, uh, I mean, based on color, based on sexual orientation, I mean, uh, discrimination is a very real thing. And uh, I, I've met very few people based on, based on ethnicity or, or uh, religious persuasion, any of that, that somebody hasn't observed or been part of that ugly word called discrimination. Uh, VIT really takes a stance of uh, going out there. And again, since I approach uh, hiring people with physical challenges, blind, visually impaired, as a technology solution, so again, because you heard, I mean, there are people doing some pretty visual things out there and yet we're using assistive technology, accessible technology to perform those tasks. So, so BIT will always have this stance when we talk to employers uh, of, you know, this is, this is just another technology. And because I, my background was IT, I can speak nerd, I speak zeros and ones. I can go out there and I can talk to CIOs and CTOs and CEOs and explain to them just how easy it is to implement accessible technology. And we have quantifiable evidence on just how easy it is to overhaul use, user interfaces and websites and all that kind of stuff. It's really, there's nothing, there's no rocket surgery to this. Trust me, in the, in the audience, we have somebody who's actually been part of like NASA launches. That's difficult stuff. Making a website accessible, not difficult at all, okay? So we go out there and we explain to them that again, if you, if you nominal investment up front for an organization, all of a sudden now, what you're able to reap, especially if they're customer consumer facing applications, is millions of more consumers that you have not been able to serve uh, at all. So, and then if they're just internal facing, now all of a sudden you're able to tap into, a, uh, again, the greatest untapped resource in America because now you're completely accessible. And then you get to reap the benefits of, of uh, assets like the three up here. So, any other questions? Uh, well, so if you go out there and you look at the uh, the normal, oh, so yeah, I'm sorry, your name? I'm Marge. Marge asked the question, uh, what are the statistics? So uh, if you go out there and you look at like NFB, there's a couple of other sites, uh, National Federation of the Blind, nfb.org, uh, they, they, they uh, state that it's 70%. I've seen numbers as low as 65%. Uh, so uh, the research that I have done, uh, Marge, is uh, so um, if we take the, uh, uh, the organizations federally, like NIB, National Institute of uh, Na National Industries of the Blind, which are the largest employer of the blind nationwide. Uh, the second largest employer is the federal government. Um, so that is a huge portion of the, let's just call it 30% that are employed. Well, again, we know uh, people who have passed the bar, people with master's degrees that are literally making 10 bucks an hour, um, making brooms and toilet paper and other stuff for the federal government for NIB. So to me, if you've got a bachelor or master's degree uh, level of education, you're making 10 bucks an hour, uh, to me, you're being marginalized and that I dare say you are underemployed. And so, um, so I always, I use the number 80% un or underemployed. That is the number that has been uh, based on my research and I've, dare say, I've been researching the hell out of this, so. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, my name's Nick, I have uh, RP, and um, it's, I've definitely seen progression uh, the last couple years and I still have, you know, pretty useful vision, but to, to Mike's point of that, that voice of doubt, uh, I just wanted to ask if anybody else had any kinds of thoughts on that, like when you're in a business situation or uh, at work and, and you had that kind of voice come out, uh, what you thought of or how you kind of dealt with it to, to overcome the task. Mr. Kemp? Um, so I'm pretty competitive, as, uh, as some people in this room can attest to. Um, and so what I... I have a lapel. I have a lapel. Um, and so... Oh, bring it a little closer. 
Um, and so, you know, what I always hated as a kid was when people would say, well, he did pretty well for a blind guy. And I would say, false, I did better than you. You know, I, I beat you on that test. I won, you know, and so I think having that competitive drive has helped me put a little bit of a chip on my shoulder so that when there is a situation where someone's discriminating or something like that, my response is, oh yeah, watch this. You know, look at what I can do and then, you know, you'll be kind of shown. So I use that little chip on my shoulder um, to give me that extra boost. Little chip? When I'm feeling, yeah, it's <laughs> bigger than, well, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's what gives me the boost. Awesome. Was it, did I answer your question, Nick? Yeah, it was pretty specific. Yeah, and I, and I dare say that uh, um, uh, dragon boating and, and getting to know Miss Christine McGroarty and, and Mr. Arthur here, uh, there, there is that kind of sense of um, uh, competitiveness. Uh, we, we, it seems like regardless of what we have to, um, we have to prove ourselves again and again and again. Am I, is that right? Yeah. Like it's not, it's not just a single time and you guys know this, right? I mean, uh, we, we, we get doubted for, you know, and then when we like, oh, look at that, they tied their shoes, you know, like, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, am I wrong? I mean, we get, I mean, people, I, I get this all the time where like I, I and I travel coast to coast. I, 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 well, Mike, I was going to ask a question of the group here. Uh, you know, the, we've been talking about a lot of the boss uh, supervisor relationship, I mean the boss employee relationship. What about the group dynamic? What is it like with the other employees? They feel like you're getting favored treatment. Do, I mean, what is the group dynamic like working as a blind person amongst other sided people? Great question, Richard. Yeah, uh, um, Eric, you want to start with you? Sure. Yeah, there's definitely that dynamic and um, sometimes I do get a sense that they are favoring me until uh, things become critical and there's no room to favor anybody and you have to perform and that's when I like to be able to step up. Um, I kind of pride myself on taking on additional responsibilities. I'd never hide from a responsibility. I try and take on anything extra that I can um, to kind of just prove to them that I'm there as a value add, that I'm not a charity case and by this point I totally have proved that. Um, but definitely, especially when, like I've had, there's quite a bit of turnover in the department I'm in. And so when we get a new teammate, um, when we get a new teammate, they will sometimes, I, you know, I have to almost have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them to explain to them, you know, how I accommodate for myself, that they don't need to like, you know, question things for me or point things out when they're reading something on a screen that I need to know because I'll listen to it or something like that. Um, so that's definitely a challenge, and, it, and Mike's totally right. You, you have to continually prove yourself because there's always going to be somebody who doubts you, but, you know, that's just the way it is. And um, at this point, I kind of embrace that. I like proving myself. I've gotten in the habit of it, so now it's just second nature. Cool. Christine, what do you, what do you, in a group setting, so you already talked about how you go down to the state capitol and, and uh, hobnob with them, but what about the, uh, your typical uh, office setting? How do, how do you... Uh, you know, uh, overcome the stigma or, or perception, all that good stuff. You know, I, I've been very, very fortunate that I have always worked with teams that 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 get there. Um, I always joke and say that it takes six months to break in a new sighted person. That you know, they're over <laughs> that. Oh my God, I didn't just say that. Did you see that? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say C. So, <laughs> It takes time to, to work people through that comfort level, but what I will say is it's very, very powerful once people get there because I, other sighted people take their cues from the folks that know you the best. So I remember I was getting on a bus one day and I, I let the bus driver help me and when I got off the bus, the passenger who was getting off in front of me wanted to help me. And I think it's because they saw that bus driver help me. At work, I'm very, um, very functional and I'm very fortunate that I'm in a team that where other people are good at the things that I'm not good at, so it's a very natural balance. But I was talking to a woman a couple weeks ago and she was talking to me about this very issue. Her coworkers were very hostile to her because they felt like she didn't have to do things. And I wish I could go back and finish that conversation and say to her, 
I think if you're going to avoid that kind of hostility, you need to offset. So if you can't do X, then you better do double of Y and, and make it fair because um, people are really quick to, to feel uh, slighted or imposed upon. And I, th I think in a work setting, it's really important that you really are pulling your own weight and that you do have the attitude that these guys are talking about that I'm, I'm going to be the best I can be and I'm going to do my fair share. And if, if you're not doing your fair share, you probably need to evaluate that and you probably need to, to make some kind of adjustment so that you are truly pulling your fair share. Awesome. And uh, what about you, Mike? I, I, so, and actually I have some insight with the, your current employer, although uh, how is it that you make the rest of the team just feel, um, feel comfortable around <coughs> your, your abilities? Yeah, so a lot of it is, is like Eric was saying, having that conversation with them and saying, listen, I've been doing this for quite some, you know, for those of us who have had our vision loss for a very long time, you say, I've been doing this for a long time. I know how to, how to figure this out. And I think, you know, that, that's one of the conversations you have to have. Luckily in project management, I can do a lot of conference calls. And it turns out people can't tell if you're blind on a conference call. <laughs> and uh, so that, particular tool has been quite useful for me. Um, and then, you know, in general, like I said, in, in the presentations, I can kind of not be wowed by the wall of numbers or what that is. And so I, I will directly tell the team, like, okay, that's the function that I will serve is I will listen very closely to the content of the idea. And then you guys can tell me later if they got the colors right, because frankly, I don't care. <laughs> Love it. I, I got a follow-up question for the three of you guys. So, because again, I, I and this is, uh, you know, my my personal. So again, I, I kind of have two sides here, where I was I was an individual contributor for a long time, gamefully employed for a long time, and to me, like n making people feel comfortable uh, wasn't necessarily something that I set out to do. Uh, it it, it kind of came natural. Um, do, do you guys do you guys find yourselves doing that though where it's like you know the whole i love what you said christine yes yeah, they look over there do you see that like like i i, I could give you know for me like i i didn't get all butt hurt over those kind of comments you know to me that's the least of our worries you know when we're maintaining employment but what, what is your guys' stance on that what do you guys think of that uh i use humor quite a bit in that situation. You know, if, if I'm the first to make the joke, um, I think it makes people a little bit more comfortable and, or, you know, I'll point it out and say, you know, you know blind leading the blind if I'm in charge of the team or you know, <laughs> just things like that. So, you know, really being the first one to, to jump to it and say, listen, it's okay. So. Okay. Christine, do you, do you have an I, I agree. stance I, on it? I think humor is, is probably the best tool for this. Humor is really important. Uh, I meant to share a little anecdote a minute ago. I recently did a training, and I hate doing this training. I have to do it every year two, two times, and there's a PowerPoint slide, and I talk for two hours, and it, it's not my favorite thing to do. So my boss had been sitting in that training, and, and he said to me, that was a really good training. And I said, was that a really good training for a blind person? <laughs> and he said... For a blind person, it was a great training, and for a regular person, it was a good training. So he, he got that I was kind of trying to make that distinction. And, and again, to sort of emphasize that point of the more people you can get comfortable around you, the more people that other people will see that they're comfortable, and so they will get comfortable. I'm probably not as direct as my my two colleagues here in terms of directly addressing vision issues. I I tend to be more in the I'm just going to do what I do and they're going to figure it out eventually and that that may not be the best strategy but but I have been fairly successful so it it may be an okay strategy. Oh and that's again so there's no right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what I'm asking for, is like, you know, my personal, again, for anybody who's out there who's saying, gosh, yeah, how, how, do you, how do we do this? How do we overcome some of these simple things out there in the corporate, you know, because we know our everyday lives, but then when you get in the corporate, there's, there's more dynamics, there's more pressure, all that kind of stuff, so how do we do it? So no good, bad, or indifferent. Eric, Eric what about you, buddy? I mean, 
Um, I don't have too much to add. I would echo um, what they've said. Uh, I think humor is a great tool. That's a great way to kind of break down, um, have an icebreaker and just kind of get comfortable with people. And then it, after that, it's usually just a conversation on how you want to work together, which in reality, you probably have to have a conversation of some sort, no matter if you're sighted or blind or visually impaired anyways, just to figure out how you're going to collaborate with people. Awesome. Thank you. Any, any other questions in the audience, guys? Anything else? Because otherwise we were going to go into some, uh, uh, some resume and uh, interview kind of uh, protocol. So any other questions? Mike, it's Penn Street. Miss Penn Street. <laughs> um, I have a question. Is I'm, I'm very fortunate to be gainfully employed. And I even work for an organization that helps other people with disabilities. But I'm one of two people there that actually have a disability. And I feel like a broken record when it comes to making trainings accessible for me or even meetings, you know, even the staff meeting, that's everything they do is, you know, a PowerPoint. And I feel like a broken record, you know, saying, can I get that PowerPoint ahead of time so I can see it, you know, with my Zoom text. I just like I'm constantly um, I don't want to be an annoyance. I want to be like what you, what the panel is saying. You know, I want to be the power person that is one step ahead. But yeah, I, I'm struggling on. I, I'm not a whiner, um, but also I don't want to fake it either. Like, oh, that was a great presentation. That was a great training. When I don't have a clue what's up there. So, does the panel have any pointers on how to go about making these accessible? but making it a, 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 a set process so that it's not every meeting I'm like asking for accommodations. Yeah, who, 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 wants, who wants to jump on that? I experienced that as well. I do have to definitely remind people to send me a PowerPoint ahead of time so that I can see it with my Zoom text. Um, and it, at some point you kind of have to try and, I guess my strategies, I try to defer the responsibility to them after they're aware that I need those things. Instead of asking for it, I expect it, and eventually they're like, oh, I need to send Eric this. It's always, I think it is always a challenge, though, especially when um, there's new people that I work with, and I work with a lot of different teams, and so it is habitual. Uh, I have one really important meeting that I'm on every month, and I've set up just a, a, a calendar reminder for the director to send me the materials beforehand, like an hour before the actual meeting. Um, so that's one of the strategies I employ, just like, uh, standard reminders in Outlook. Yeah, and I think you're you're forcing people to do things they should do anyway. So being blind requires a certain level of discipline um, in that you have to prepare before a meeting. You have to do these things that people should be doing anyway. Like as a project manager, that's just good project management to send out the, the agenda and the deck beforehand. Um, and so, you know, that's kind of how I've overcome it is this isn't just because I'm blind. This is just good preparation activity that you should be doing um, is, is sending out the agenda, sending out the PowerPoint beforehand. And what I found is it forces people to think about their PowerPoints before they send them to me. It's because most, most of the time they're doing them f up to five minutes before the, the meeting. Um, and so I get a little bit better quality products out of my presentations than I ask for them maybe 24 hours in advance, um, as is kind of the, the standard protocol. Um, you know, when you can kind of make it just a role for everyone, I think it makes it a little easier. Awesome. Christine, do you have anything to add here? So I totally hear your frustration. Um, I used to sit on the, the diversity committee for, the, for my department, and um, the, the state has gone to Google Docs, and I have really struggled with that. And the diversity committee kept sending things out in Google Docs. And I thought, this is the height of hypocrisy, that the people that are supposed to be doing diversity can't be respectful of, you know, they're, they're focused on other kinds of diversity. And they forget that disability is another group that has some diversity. So I, I feel your frustration. It is incredibly frustrated. And I, I, unfortunately, I, I love the calendar reminder. I think that's a great idea. But unfortunately, I think we have to go to our blind friends and grump about how irritating that is, and then we still have to stay positive. And, oh, I just wanted to remind you, I need that in advance. And it is incredibly frustrating. But I, th I think sometimes we, we just have to 
continue to remind people over and over and over again, and it is frustrating. Then uh, I will add, yeah, yep, I know, yep, I checked. Uh, so I uh, wanted to, uh, so my, my two cents on that too, Pan, is, uh, um, you know, I mean, if you want me to talk to the organization about what's called compliance, let me know, okay? Just thrown out a shameless plug there, so. Um, uh, so, so. So, uh, no, okay, so we have uh, just 15 minutes left to go, and if there are no, there's one more question? Yeah, my name is Janelle, and I have a question. You, um, one of the questions I struggle with is, you said working, like, most employees work nine to five. Do you feel like you have to work two or three more hours a day just to meet what an employee who is visually able to see does, or do you still work with that work-life balance of only working nine to five? Great question. I, so to me, like our, our day is always uh, exponentially longer because of the commute. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, tell me, I mean, um, you guys, so there's a certain lo level of proficiency that happens over mastering your craft as well. So uh, to me, I've always like, as an engineer, I, I learned to work smarter and not harder. And to me, so I, for me as a techie, as a nerd, I learned to automate the crap out of things. So uh, simple things all the time that would help me. Although again, that's because I had that prowess, but uh, you know, for uh, you know, MBAs and, and budgetary folks, do you guys have to work harder or is it, or is it, is it truly smarter? I would say that I've been fortunate and I have not had that situation happen a lot. I, I could see that it would. Um, I, I, I deal with about 100 emails every day. And um, I, I am sure that if I could see them, I could deal with them more quickly. So I, I'm fortunate in that that extra time doesn't necessarily push me out past my 5 o'clock window. But there definitely are tasks that, that I I could do more efficiently, but uh, Mike is right. When when you get to a point of mastery, you you probably, for the most part. Although I will tell you, if I had to use Google for my email, <laughs> I would be hours. It would add hours to my day. So it, it's about having the right tools. And to the point I was making earlier, I I do think that I need to spend time outside of work, staying current with the technology. Um, it's something that I'm finding I, I don't have time to do at work. For example, I have a, a webinar from JAWS on using JAWS and Google Docs, and I don't have time during the workday to listen to that. So I think there are things that I have to do outside of work hours to keep myself uh, relevant and current. Awesome. That answer your question. I forgot your name. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions, guys? I have one or two. Yes, please. So I'm a junior in high school and I have starboard seas. So okay. I'll be applying to college over the summer. Oops. Uh, thanks. Sorry. Uh, so I have Stargardt disease and I'll be applying to colleges over the summer. Uh, so I was wondering to what extent I should mention blindness in college uh, applications and essays because I think it's a different but analogous situation to a job interview. Great word. What do you think? What do you guys say? I mean, I, guys? I I did not when I first applied, um, but I did definitely did when I applied for my MBA, and I would take the same route um, I did with the interview process, with just full disclosure and uh, owning it as a, a benefit that the, the bringing you to their university would um, add tremendous value because of your visual impairment. Awesome, Mike. Yeah, I would 100% agree that I think it, if anything, helped uh, more so than than hurt, especially the, the organization. So at, at DU, they were very, you know, they're all about, they call it inclusive excellence. And so sort of being that part of that group that they could then, you know, put on flyers and brochures and things like that. Sure, it, it's a little demeaning, but, you know, <laughs> helped get some scholarships, so. Awesome. I agree. I, I think that unlike the job market, it, it universities are places where they're going for things like inclusiveness. So I, I think it's a benefit, uh, again, framing it as a positive, and I, I think it's a good thing to do. Awesome. That, that answer? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So, 
Okay, yeah, keep them, keep them coming. Keep them, we're here for you. Your name? Okay. Um, I'm asking for my son. He has RP. He I, still has some vision. Um, he has stopped reading because it's just so damn hard. I have the impression that you guys have become more competent in your own abilities through the process of going to school and studying and having the opportunity to use the equipment. Would you say that's true? You mean accessible technology, meaning the equipment? Yeah. So for, for me personally, like, it, like it, I, it, accessible technology is my world. Like there's nothing I have ever done as a blind engineer or running BIT without accessible technology. And I have to read copious amounts of contracts and other, other, other kinds of uh, data. Um, and so it's without a doubt, it's, uh, and it, there are challenges like Christine's already talked about that we have to go through where sometimes like, ah, you know, um, a single, especially if you're doing it on your iOS device and, you know, you accidentally touch it while it's reading it and you got to start it over and you're like, there are all these, you know, pains in the butt kind of things that we have to deal with. Although it's the burden is, a, is incumbent upon us, right? To, um, you know, blindness doesn't give you an excuse to be ignorant. It doesn't, doesn't allow you to just sit back and let the world go by just because we're unable to see. That's, that's my personal view. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when, what do you guys think? I think it's clear that, that I'm not a techie person. I use it because I have to, but I, you know, I don't sit at home and play for the fun of loving technology. And it, it, part of it is because, when, for me, when I learn something new, it's usually pretty hard and pretty frustrating. Um, I spent an hour last night trying to click on a link on a web page, and I, I just couldn't. It wasn't properly labeled or marked or whatever, and I, I literally spent an hour. And then I gave up on the internet, and I tried to go do it on my phone, and I couldn't do it on my phone. So I, I think one of my personal characteristics is an incredible tolerance for frustration <laughs> until you learn this stuff, it is frustrating, and you don't learn it until you've done it a fair amount. And so I, I can understand that, you know, if he's at the beginning of that path, it, it's incredibly frustrating to, to try for an hour to click on a link that you know a sighted person could come and go, boop, and there it would be, clicked on, all set. Okay. That help? Yeah. Okay. So uh, got, got just a few minutes left, although uh, I'd like to have Mr. Kemp here is going to give us some, uh, some um, interview and resume protocol. Is that right, my friend? Yeah. So, okay. um, you know, from a, from a perspective of being someone who's gone through this before and I, you know, through going through an MBA, had the, had the chance to take classes on how to do a resume, how to do an interview. There are tips and tricks that I think our whole community needs to know about. Um, so I wanted to just run through a few of those that, that I do when we do, um, as Mike said, those mock interviews and resume reviews. Um, so, you know, I'll just kind of burn through them as, as quick as I can. But on, on resume reviews, there's two types of resumes. There's chronological and functional, right? So functional resumes are rarely ever used. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about them too much unless you want to then talk to me afterwards. Uh, but chronological is just following your employment history and really your story who you are as a, as a candidate to them. Um, and that's typically how we, we think of them. And then the, the structure is that it usually starts with a mission statement. So why are you sending me a resume? Is it, okay, I want to be a welder. Okay, well, you know, we do project management, so maybe try somewhere else. Um, <laughs> you know, you got to really focus in on, on what you want to do um, with, with that mission statement. And then, you know, unless you're a recent graduate, then you jump right into your work experience. And this, for, for our group of people, can be um, a, a difficult thing with, you know, typically what HR folks will do is look for a reason to weed you out. So how, how can I kick you out of this process? And so the, the work experience, especially with gaps in employment, uh, like we all tend to have, um, can, can really pull you out of the process. And so what I like to do is just fill it in with, 
okay, I volunteered with this group while I was unemployed, or I, you know, worked on a, on a project that just interested me, um, and really showing them that, yeah, I was doing things um, during that, that period of unemployment. Um, and then the other thing that I see a lot is just industry jargon. So, you know, throwing out, well, I did uh, RFP on the DBA administrator for the TLA on, <laughs> you know, it, it's going in front of an HR person who has no idea what any of those mean um, and, and wouldn't be able to filter that. So in your field, that may make sense, um, but to this HR person, which is really the point of a resume, you won't ever get a job from the resume. You'll, you'll get it by getting past HR and to the people who, who do the work. Um, and, and so really having that, um, that, that story set out um, in a way that's understandable to the, the common man, if you will, um, is, is pretty crucially important. Um, and then there's how we dress. So for a lot of us blind people, how someone is dressed is not necessarily important to us um, because we're, we're luckily able to see past that. Um, however, <laughs> sighted people. So to speak. <laughs> yeah, I like to use those as much as possible. It makes people uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> however, sighted people cannot get past that. So unless the, the exterior is perfect for them, um, really the, the interior isn't something they're going to get to see. Um, and, and so they, they've done studies on this where they had you know, people who were dressed in suits negotiate fake real estate deals and people who were dressed in sweatpants. Well, the people who dressed in suits always got a better deal or were on the winning side of that negotiation. Um, and, and so there's, there's just that, that perception that we have to get past and, and really kind of make the perfect exterior so, or, so that people can see the, the real good interior that we all have. Um, so now I'll kind of jump to interviews because I know we're, we're strained on time. Um, so, you know, I think there's a couple of things that I think are important with interviews. One is practice your elevator pitch. Practice telling someone your story from start to finish because the first question anyone asks you typically is, okay, walk me through your resume. And what they're asking you to do is give a compelling story of your past history. Um, and, and so, you know, it's really obnoxious, but I actually do practice that in front of the mirror. And my wife has walked in on me, you know, speaking to myself um, fairly frequently when I'm practicing that. Um, but it, it's really helped in interviews. And then I think the, the other thing that's quite helpful is um, you're always going to ask, get asked those behavioral questions. So tell me about a time when you demonstrated leadership, or as I said before, my favorite, overcame an obstacle. Um, and so what I like to do is, is practice what's called the STAR technique for that. So it's the situation that, that you were in, the task you were assigned, the action that you took, and then the result of that action. So by following that method, and I literally write these down before an interview and, and will, again, practice them, um, but by going through that technique, I find that my stories are incredibly concise and compelling because I gave them, oh, okay, Mike was given a, a task to lead a team and they actually were successful. That's what I needed to know out of that question, um, and he was able to demonstrate that. Excuse me, Mike, could you repeat that? Sure. Uh, it's the, um, the STAR technique. So the situation you were in, the task you were given, the action you took, and the result that happened. Thank you. Yep. So those are some of the, the general tips and tricks. I have other you know, magic tricks that I can tell you. Um, if you want to talk later. Mike, I'll, I'll give you another five minutes. Go, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, please, Mike. All right. So, uh, again, with the, the interviews, um, one thing I want to harp on is um, really doing your research beforehand. Um, so I like to know kind of a scary amount of details about who is interviewing me, um, you know, where they went to school, what their work experience is, uh, you know, at one point I realized I had to stop researching because I knew where this person's kids went to school, uh, their home address, their net worth. Um, <laughs> but it, it's things like that that as a blind person are, are extremely valuable. So you might not be able to read a, uh, a social cue that, that someone's giving you, but you know that, okay, well, they were on a, you know, uh, on the Committee for the Republican National Convention. 
okay, I'm probably not going to talk about tax reform with this person, um, you know, really kind of helping you to structure how you're going to answer questions based on who you're talking to. So really knowing your audience is pretty crucial and doing that research beforehand is helpful. Um, and then I think networking is absolutely crucial. And this is for sighted and non-sighted people. I've been talking to a few people recently who have been looking for jobs and they said, yeah, I sent out 10 resumes last week and I haven't gotten anything. I said, okay, well, how many people did you meet with? How long were you talking to them? Um, you know, th those kinds of things are the real metrics that help you get employed. Really, it's sitting down and having coffee or drinks or lunch or whatever it is with anyone who will have you, regardless of their position in the organization. Um, you know, salesmen will give you the, the 10 3 1 rule. So if you get 10 leads, three of them are actually going to sit down and talk to you, and one of them are going to buy. Um, so for every one job you get, you have to go on you know, between 10 and, you know, even 100 interviews or, or 100 informational interviews like Christine was talking about that, that will really get you where you need to go because it's the people who are going to make those connections for you, not necessarily the, the resume you submit with hundreds of thousands of other resumes that are going to get you that job. So that's, uh, those are kind of my tips and tricks. Thank you so much. Yep. Uh, appreciate that, Mike. Uh, any any other questions for uh, Mike, Christine, yeah, Eric, I have myself? A question. Yes. So, if you are in a networking situation, hi, my name is Lindsay, and I have RP. Um, so if you're in a networking situation where you're meeting people for the first time and they don't recognize that you are visually impaired, how do you address that situation? So for example, I've had people put out their hand to shake my hand and I don't see that. So they think that I'm being rude or I don't know. Right. So you, you, you don't use a cane right now, right? No, no. Okay. So I, uh, I wish I could tell you how many folks I've coached. You don't have to have a full-blown you know, Jake, okay, the, there, we go. there we go. Thank you, Jake, the insurance guy. All right. Um, <laughs> sorry. Would right. you repeat that? Yeah. So, so, so again, you have to you you have to either be willing to you know have some kind of a visual indicator, right? Which isn't always comfortable. Like when we're losing, like man, last thing we want to tell the world is like I'm losing my sight. Let's call a spade a spade here, Lindsay. We're fr we're, we're afraid to like tell the whole world like, hey, I'm going blind because all of a sudden now. We even have more of that, that, that target on our back, right at square on our chest, saying that, man, there's something different about us. But it's how do we embrace that? How do we let the world know, like, yeah, I'm, like, yeah, I'm here and I'm having a good time. And, and before you know it, I, I, I wish I could tell you now, I mean, it's, it's been years in the making. But now when I go into social settings, I, I, you know, this, this attracts people. The cane will attract people because I'm in there and I'm having a good time. And people are coming up to and, and we want to make this like we're part of the community. We're not, we're not separate from the community gate, but we have to be willing to either, either have a, a visual indicator or we got to be damn good at shaking hands and kissing babies. <laughs> so either way, it's just, but it's a technique and there's no magic pill to it. It's just something we got to, we got to sharpen. Am I, am I right? Wrong guys? Good. Yeah. So, um, I know we're just about, I know we're done, although, uh, we're, we'll be here. If you guys have any more questions, we want to thank foundation fighting blindness for having us here today. Uh, again, the three panelists, uh, they do not work or I'm not giving them a toast or anything for being here. This was on, they volunteered to do this. So please, please, please thank them for being here.